Welcome to Salem, North Carolina in 1823. I'm Sister Tara, and today we're here to learn about how the early Moravians were making their pottery in the 1800s. This may not look like the place that you would expect to see a potter at work. You might expect to see me in a really nice workshop, maybe with a fancy potter's wheel, spinning the wheel and shaping the clay with my hands. But today we're here to really get to the root of where my clay comes from. And it's coming from streams just like this one. When the Moravians first came to this part of North Carolina in the early 1700s, there were no other established European settlements in the area. But in this part of the southern woodland, there were a number of indigenous tribes like the Cherokee, who had their own traditions of pottery making. Now pottery in this part of the world is very important because that's how you're going to be storing your food and preserving it so that you have food to eat in the winter time. Now at this time period, the potter couldn't just go to the store and buy a box of clay to make his pottery. He had to go down to the stream and actually dig up the clay himself. Or rather, get other people to dig it for him. This is pretty hard work after all. Now he would have had young apprentices who would have been learning to become potters digging the clay, and he also had some enslaved people digging the clay depending on what time period you're looking at. One of those enslaved potters was a man by the name of Peter Oliver. Peter was an enslaved man born into slavery in Virginia before he was sent to North Carolina to work for the Moravians. Now just because he was enslaved doesn't mean that he only did hard labor like digging up clay. Evidence shows that Peter was actually a very skilled and knowledgeable potter who could be considered a craftsman in his own right. Any good potter knows that clay is a type of mud, but not just any mud. Clay is the smallest pieces of mud made from the ittiest, bittiest, teeniest, tiniest, broken down pieces of rocks and sand. Those particles are called sediment, and the smallest pieces of sediment are clay. And what better place to find it than in this creek? Just look around. Whenever it rains, the water runs down the sides of the hills here and washes all of those pieces of sediment down the side of the creek and into the water. As they flow over the big rocks, they break off into smaller and smaller particles. And those smallest particles settle to the bottom or get swept up against the side into banks of bright red clay. Some of the larger pieces of sediment end up as soil, like the kind we might find in a garden. And the largest pieces of sediment that we find are sediment like sand. So when Peter Oliver was coming down here to dig for clay, what he was actually digging up was a soupy mixture of clay, sand, and water. The potters during Peter's time would have done a process called washing the clay. What they would do is they would take the soupy clay that they dug up from the creek and they would filter it through something like a horsehair sieve or a piece of linen. That could filter out the larger particles like the sand and the finest sediment like clay and water is gonna go through, creating this really soupy mixture that we call slop. I don't know about you, but I have a feeling that this kind of clay is not going to be holding its shape very well. I don't see this turning into a mug anytime very soon. Now what the potters would have done at this time period to help get some of the water out of their clay is they would have used evaporation to help them out. They could scoop out some of the soupy clay and place it onto plaster boards. And as the water evaporates into the air and leaves the clay, the clay is gonna start to get thicker and stiffer, like this clay here that's been sitting out overnight. And I could actually shape that into a mug or a plate or all kinds of things like that. One of the things that we know Peter Oliver would have made the most was pipe heads like these for smoking tobacco. Today we know that smoking tobacco is bad for us, but back then they just didn't know that yet. And people were actually buying pipes like these in the hundreds, selling them all up and down the East Coast, even as far away as Philadelphia. Before I can have hard finished pieces of pottery like these pieces here, I'm starting out with clay that's still pretty squishy. I'm gonna have to dry it out overnight, maybe even for a couple of days. And that will give me something a little bit hard, 
and kind of dusty and chalky feeling, like these pieces here. This is what potters call greenware. It's just air-dried pottery. In fact, they're so dry that if I put one of these into a bucket of water right now, it would disintegrate right back into a soupy mush. Now, we don't want mugs that turn into mush when we put our drinks in them, do we? So what we have to do is we've got to find a way to make all of that sediment glue together. That's where heat and pressure come in. Little dry pieces of pottery like this are going to be put into the potter's kiln, where they will be fired to about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's like lava temperatures. And that's what's going to melt all of those pieces of sediment together and fuse them into a hardened piece of pottery like this one here. If I want one that's even more finished, one that's shiny, like this one here, then I'm gonna have to use a process called glazing the pottery. Glazing is going to require adding more sediment and even more heat and pressure. Let's look at what that's like. The glaze is the shiny layer on top of my clay. It starts out as a larger type of sediment than clay, something more like sand. I can mix them with water and turn it into kind of a paint. Now what I can do is I'm gonna take this soupy mixture of larger sediment and I'm gonna paint it directly onto the clay. Now you can see that right here, it's starting to look kind of dusty and chalky. That certainly doesn't look shiny yet. This is going to go back into the kiln again and be heated back up to 2000 degrees one more time. And when it does, the larger sediment is going to melt into a very thin layer of glass all along the surface of my pot, making it nice and shiny and waterproof. The same way that sand in nature can get heated in a volcano and cool into shiny obsidian rocks. One of the things we do know about Peter Oliver is that he didn't stay enslaved forever digging up clay in the creek. Eventually, he sold enough of those pipe heads to save up enough money to actually purchase his freedom. After he bought his freedom, he quit the pottery and became a farmer, working the soil for himself instead of the clay for others. Pipes like these have been found in gardens and creeks all over the area, where they've gotten lost over the last 200 years. Eventually, those pieces might weather and erode right back into the sediment that they first started from. They'll wash here into this creek where potters like you and me can come and dig for clay. And think about the early potters who were here before us, like Peter Oliver.